Hello. Welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of entrepreneurship. This is a, a, a presentation that typically includes, although it's customizable, things such as do you want to be an entrepreneur and how do you manage entrepreneurial ventures. I've got a sample here on fundraising. And I would like to start off with a quick two by two diagram of the relationship between innovation and entrepreneurship. And I'll, I'll let you know ahead of time, this graph is also going to be on the beginning of my innovation presentation. So if you've seen that one first, you can fast forward a couple of minutes. But the reason I like to do this is because right now, both of these entrepreneurship and innovation are so fashionable. And a lot of the startups that we see in all the headlines are both. I want to point out that those aren't necessarily the same thing. There's, there, you can be one, uh, a different level of one and the other. So for example, here I've put innovation. I've got some companies that are uh, generally low innovation versus high, and I've got entrepreneurship, uh, low level of entrepreneurship, you know, established companies versus high level of entrepreneurial venture. And so for the high, high innovation, high entrepreneurship, I put a couple of uh, startups like Google. This would be a lot of the dot coms, a lot of the Facebooks, the, the companies that we see now that sort of started out uh, in the garage or in somebody's dorm room and are now becoming public. Um, I also put SpaceX because it's important to remember uh, the information technology, like the social networking, has really driven the uh, uh, the news cycle on on these subjects. But SpaceX is a is a not an information technology company. It doesn't have to be IT. And as a matter of fact, most companies are an entrepreneurial at some point. But these are ones that I put as high innovation, high entrepreneurship. You can also have a high level of innovation without being an entrepreneurial venture. And here I use 3M as my example. They are the managers of the business units at 3M are required to uh, derive a certain amount of their uh, revenue from products developed within the last several years. So they have a continuous uh, incentive to continue to create innovative products. Also, I put GE there, another manufacturing business. They, uh, they do a lot of innovate. They, they have some uh, classic industrial areas, but even there, they're usually in, uh, trying to innovate like their jet engines. They're trying to come up with more fuel efficient jet engines. They're also in the healthcare space. So I've generally a high level of innovation. You could also put pharmaceutical companies here um, because they're generally publicly held, but, but are always deriving their profits from their breakout products. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you have companies that are highly entrepreneurial, but not necessarily innovative. My classic example for that is a McDonald's franchise. It's an established business model. The products are well known and the, the brand is well known, but they're usually owned by small businesses, small uh, businessmen and women who, who purchase a franchise. So that's an entrepreneurial venture that's not very innovative. And then uh, counter to a lot of fashion, you can actually be low level of innovation and low level of entrepreneurship, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I use examples like Jack Daniels. This is a product that's uh, almost preferred because of its classic um, uh, characteristics. The, 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 the fact that there is low innovation is one of the things that's appealing about it. I also use Harley Davidson as a similar example, but those are both still owned by large publicly owned companies. They're not, they're not entrepreneurial and, and they haven't been essentially since their founding. So with that in mind, the difference between innovation and entrepreneurship, let's talk about entrepreneurship specifically. And the first question I like to ask is, do you want to be an entrepreneur? I am concerned that there's a lot of uh, uh, incentive, a lot of sort of social factors. It's very glamorous to be an entrepreneur now. And I want to point out some of the reasons I think that is and some of the reasons I think that we should hesitate. Um, this, for example, spectrum is how much money you make. And this being high and this being low, if you look at the x-axis here, and the y-axis being probability. So if you really think about entrepreneurial ventures, it's a fact that most start businesses fail. That includes both small businesses in general and even a lot of the tech companies. So the, uh, I put the zero here because most entrepreneurial ventures here in purple will lose money. Whereas if you just go and get a, a square job based on your skills, you will have both a positive uh, income expect uh, positive expected income and you'll also notice not only is it the actual amount of money you make but the the variance will be narrower because the the variance in entrepreneurial ventures is really wide you can lose a lot of money or you can become a billionaire you usually don't get to be a billionaire as somebody's staff accountant uh, unless you happen to go to an entrepreneurial venture which kind of mixes both but the point i want to talk about here is uh if you'll notice why does everybody want to be an entrepreneur? Why is it fashionable? I think it's because the news coverage 
gets to be the people here on the long end of the tail. The, the people who strike it rich, become billionaires, um, and, and have established brands, even if, whether they're IT or not. And, and for that reason, I think people really don't do a lot of critical analysis. So what this chart, I think, does is illustrate some of the thinking you should have about whether or not you wish to be an entrepreneur. And I put down what I consider to be some of the wrong reasons to be an entrepreneur. And as I've demonstrated here, uh, money is, is actually generally a bad reason to be an entrepreneur. Now, you might say that uh, look at all the people who've made a lot of money in it. And I always draw the analogy, that's like taking your retirement account and putting it on a number at the roulette wheel. If you hear a story about someone who did that, all of a sudden they struck it rich based on you know, whatever they had on their, in their 401k. But the expected value was negative. So money is actually not a very good reason to become an entrepreneur. Another element that I talk about is fashion. Uh, right now it's very fashionable to do, but I want to remember that that fades. And the thing that you start, it usually takes multiple years to become successful as an entrepreneur. And entrepreneur, uh, the, the industry you go into, especially if it's IT, you never know. That can fade, that can become uh, out of fashion, and yet you're already sort of stuck in it, making lousy money and, uh, for an uncertain future. And it's also important to point out that it's, it's not for everyone because this variance can be very uh, stressful. You don't really know if you're going to make money or lose money. And that means it sort of takes a special kind of person to become an entrepreneur and really shoot for the, uh, shoot for the stars. Most people would be happier with a job. And I, I'm a little bit concerned that when people say it's not for everyone, a lot of people in the audience think, wow, uh, I'm, not everyone. I'm not just anyone, I'm a special person. It's important to remember that being <laughs> not for everyone does not necessarily mean it's good or select or exclusive. I always say jail is not for everyone that doesn't make it a place that you want to be. Also, I wanted to point out on fashion, um, you know, we think uh, young people might always think that entrepreneurship and dot coms, these are the fashionable things to do, but it wasn't always that way. That can fall out of favor. For example, if you look at post-war United States, telling everybody that you worked for IBM or General Electric or General Motors, that was much more of a status symbol than mentioning that you worked at a startup that nobody would heard of. Um, so those are some bad reasons. So what, does that mean I'm anti Entrepreneurship? Absolutely not. You could argue I'm an entrepreneur myself. Um, I wanted to point out some of the things that I think are good reasons, um, such as you are passionate about a product or a service or an industry or solving a particular problem that you find vexing because that will drive you, that will motivate you as time gets hard. If you really believe in what you're doing, uh, it, will, it will help you uh, uh, overcome a lot of the unusual obstacles and maybe make you more tolerant of the risk involved. The other thing is sometimes people just prefer the environment of a startup. If you go get a job at a large company or an established company, um, oftentimes the larger businesses you make more money. So there you have the advantage of a higher salary and oftentimes better benefits. Uh, but they also become more bureaucratic. And that's not, uh, you know, a lot of people like to sort of a lot of especially entrepreneurs love to sort of sneer at the large organizations, but there are reasons for that. If you have a 10,000 person organization, you have to have more rules and standards of conduct than if it's just the five of you, because you know everybody and you know what they're doing if it's only five and you just tell them to knock it off. But as, as, the, as the breadth of the organization expands, that gets harder to do. So there's a reason for that. And if you really love the sort of startup, you love the flexibility, you know, if you work at a startup, there's oftentimes not a lot of rules for what you have to do because nobody's actually written the rule book and you get a lot of discretion. Um, and, and that can change as an organization grows. And for that reason, oftentimes entrepreneurs end up leaving as their ventures get larger because they prefer this environment and they become serial entrepreneurs. So there's some good reasons. Here are some reasons that I think are a little bit more debatable. One of the reasons I think people will like the environment of a startup is because they get a thrill out of taking the risk. They like, you know, they might actually have a gambling problem. They like shooting for the stars and they like, in a bizarre way, risking everything. They're sort of uh, gamblers and business, uh, especially entrepreneurial ventures. You'll also find sometimes these guys working in investments as hedge fund managers or whatnot. Their business is almost a socially acceptable way for them to indulge in their gambling addiction. And I put that as questionable because you might say that they fit better in entrepreneurial ventures, but it's also questionable as to whether or not they would have just been happier in uh, a therapy and found whatever it is that that sort of found something more healthy to f give them that sense of, to fill the, the emptiness they might be trying to fill through uh, risk taking. 
Another one is, um, I've talked about here entrepreneurial ventures being bad because you expect to lose money. There are some people who are particularly savvy who are able to start uh, ventures with other people's money. And they are essentially gambling with someone else's money and it's heads they win, tails the investor loses. So if that is the case, you essentially block out this segment of the purple and you actually end up being in a positive financial uh, situation. I put that as questionable because that's, well, that's not necessarily in the best interest. You're not doing a very good job of representing those investors' interests necessarily. So a lot of slick salesmen and uh, uh, politically savvy people are able to do that. If you're on the investor side, these are the worst possible scenarios because you will find someone who is a gambling problem trying to invest using your money where they don't have the downside and that is, uh, that's certainly not a position you want to be as an investor. So bear that in mind as you filter some of the pitches you'll hear. And I put a couple of tests down to sort of help you evaluate, you know, which of these reasons are you in it for? I always say, if you're gonna spend five, let's say you're gonna do an entrepreneurial venture. Let's say it takes you five years. That's a pretty normal uh, period of time before we figure out if, the, if it's gonna work or not. And if you were to work in whatever venture you're considering for five years and it turned out a failure, obviously you're gonna be disappointed no matter what. But how would you feel about the time you spent? Would you say, look, I'm glad I, sp I invested that time. I've learned some skills. I've learned about this business. I tried to solve a problem I was passionate about. Maybe now I'm gonna go to work for a company in the same field. That experience will be relevant. If you sort of say, oh my gosh, that was a waste of time. I followed the fad and the fad faded and or the business venture didn't end up being one of the leaders in those fields. It was a total waste. If you can sort of project how you would feel about that, that can tell you whether you're doing it for the be better reasons or the worst. Um, the last one I give as a test is uh, if you find that the reason you like entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial ventures is because you fantasize about getting here and then uh, cashing out, selling the business, buying a Ferrari, moving to an island, dating models, my, uh, the, the cash out daydreams, that is an indication that you might be in it for the wrong reasons because you're much more likely to end up here than you are here and you're gonna be chasing those daydreams for a, a longer time. It's better to find something that you're passionate about and that you believe in and do it every day so that even if it doesn't work out, you're not disappointed. Because if you're daydreaming about a cash out, you'll certainly be disappointed if it fails, which is most likely to do. <clears throat> Let's move on from that. So that's some filters on whether or not you wanna be an entrepreneur. Let's talk about, the, I have several topics that I talk about in entrepreneurship. I've chosen fundraising for this sample. Um, there are a couple of ways that you can think about raising money. You can say, I want to raise uh, as little money as I think I need and just do it frequently and go back every time I need the money. The advantage of that, uh, and, and we're going to compare that, this is versus uh, asking for as much money as you can get as soon as you can possibly get it. More money up front. The advantage of going for less money more frequently is that you preserve your equity. You get less dilution. You've essentially uh, you, you have the opportunity to build the value of the business before you go back to the, the well and ask for more. And as a result, by the time you need more money, you will have to give away, the company's more valuable and you have to give away less equity for the same amount of cash. So there's less dilution per dollar. The other advantage is if you're fortunate enough to have a business that swings cash flow positive, you don't have any dilution at all because you're able to fund your growth with cash flow or you might even be able to raise debt because uh, bankers generally don't want to do venture capital, but they, do, they are interested in loaning money to companies that have reliable cash flows. So that's the less more frequently. The get, get as much as you can as soon as you can has several re, uh, advantages to it at, uh, as well. First of all, the business plan or the business model tends to change, that's a delta to represent changing. And as a result, more money gives you the flexibility to adapt your business plan. It, gives you, it buys you some time to really sort it out. I have a, a professor of mine at Harvard Business School, a guy named Bill Salman, uh, Dr. Salman, um, generally pretty well, well known in the entrepreneurial area. He said of the thousands of business plans he's reviewed, he's probably seen three of them that hit their target exactly. And so the point is business plans should be expected to fail. Uh, or I shouldn't say fail, I should say change. Because as he would put it, a business plan is not a predictive tool, it is a diagnostic tool. So if something's not working, you change it. And it's sort of, it's, it's like a map that helps you understand, navigate your way towards a successful business. Um, the, uh, 
the treating it as a predictive model that you throw away if it doesn't uh, uh, meet your expectations would be somewhat pointless because very very few of them will actually meet your expectations. Um, another reason, uh, so you buy time by raising more money to get the business model right. Another reason you might want more money up front is management attention. Go, keeping going back to the well and asking for more funding can keep a lot of your senior managers engaged in fundraising rather than actually running the business. Another th reason you might want more upfront money is oftentimes, you know, we, t we tend to think of businesses as an S curve. That's the classic, you know, starts out low, then you hit, hit it big and get adoption, and then once everybody's adopted, it levels out. The truth is a lot of business plans actually go, uh, have, a, have a dip growth pattern or a lumpy growth pattern where they tend to do well, but then uh, something goes wrong and they lose, and it'll help you through those wells. There's oftentimes a, a rocky start to a startup venture. Another reason to ask for more upfront is this is just sort of intuitive. It's not specific to entrepreneurial ventures. You might have noticed things are more likely to go over budget than they are to go under budget. So uh, uh, always good to have uh, a cash reserve, a war chest, if you will. And the last one, uh, this is one that I uh, uh, think is important in particular, is that people tend to make better decisions if they have a cash cushion. As, as money runs out, people tend to get desperate and they start taking, you know, we talked about risk, they start taking greater and greater risks because they know that if they run out of cash, the business goes away. So they're more likely to bet on a long shot. They do the Hail Mary pass. And if you're an investor, that's not a good thing. So uh, you tend to want more upfront because you'll end up with better decisions. If, pe if people have a little cushion, they're a little bit more rational in their decision making. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, this is also true if you are uh, in, in, in any venture that's risking bankruptcy where their cash flow can't cover their debt, whether it's entrepreneurial or not, as you approach that level where the equity becomes worthless, they start taking long shots. So that's a little bit on fundraising. Uh, because I had the space, because I, I used uh, something I'm gonna repeat here, I put a little extra bonus down here. Um, we talked earlier about the S-curve. This is usage by customers. And I left the Y-axis here a little ambiguous because it sort of depends. You can think of for use, this can be uh, revenue or this can be number of users. And this is time here on the X-axis. So this is the classic X-curve. As time goes on, you develop your product, then people start to recognize it and there's a big growth, but then the market matures and people have adopted it and so your use levels off. And if you're in products that are iterative, uh, you'll have another S-curve the next year and, and the next year as the, as the products continue to improve. So this can be product specific, not just industry. Um, Gartner, the technology consulting firm, talks about what they call the hype cycle. And what generally happens is things tend to be over amplified as the enthusiasm becomes excessively optimistic. And then there's sort of a disappointment as people realize, you know, there's only so much to this business and then things level off and that's the hype. And this is what I consider to be, this is my particular edition. I put the two of these together. And the reason the hype cycle tends to get so elaborate is uh, part human nature. We tend to get optimistic. We tend to like the fashionable things. But if you look at the S curve, at this point when the hype cycle is peaking, we don't actually know where it starts to level off. It usually peaks mid cycle. So for all we know, this could come up here and that's why the hype tends to be over amplified. You could also draw an, an analogy with, uh, for those of you economically minded people, it's kind of like a feedback loop where uh, you know, things are going up so people uh, invest more which makes them go up further. Um, so this is something to bear in mind, and this is particularly relevant after our discussion on fundraising, because what you usually want to do is raise your money uh, right about here, because that is where you will be getting the least level, the most enthusiasm means you'll have the least dilution for every dollar that you raise. So anyway, that's some, uh, that's some examples of entrepreneurship. If you would like to have this presented, please contact me for a proposal. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.